thanks everyone for being here uh, for this great talk. Uh, I'm very excited to welcome Zachary Mallet. Zachary is the inaugural Strauch Fellow in the Department of City and Regional Planning at Cornell University's College of Architecture, Art, and Planning. His research focuses on the interaction between transportation finance, travel behavior, and urban form. Prior to his academic career, Dr. Mallet was an elected member of the governing board of the San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit District, also known as BART, uh, where he served for four years and advocated for policies to be based on empirical findings and conscious of long-term financial impacts. Dr. Mallet received his PhD in urban planning and development from the University of Southern California, Master of City and City Planning from the University of California, Berkeley, and bachelor's, de bachelor's degree from Stanford University. I also want to acknowledge that today's lecture is sponsored by the Bayer Family Fund in honor of the late Glenn H. Bayer. Professor Bayer taught in both the College of Architecture, Art, and Planning and in the College of Human Ecology. He was before his time in his interest in issues related to sustainable design and environmentally sensitive planning. Today's lecture reflects the kind of forward thinking that was characteristic of Professor Beyer. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Zachary Millet. Well, thanks so much for that introduction, and I hope that I can be heard uh, virtually. I think I'm hearing myself right now. Um, a couple additional acknowledgments. Uh, Dr. Klein mentioned that I am the inaugural Strock Fellow, uh, so want to acknowledge Hans and Roger Strock, who put together the fellowship that finances my position and for which this presentation is uh, uh, a deliverable for. They put together the broadening participation program. And then lastly, today's event is co-hosted by the St. Louis chapter of the Transportation Research Forum. I presented at the Transportation Research Forum's annual meeting earlier this year, and they requested that I return. We put together this co-hosting event uh, in order to accommodate that. So uh, this research is part of my dissertation on uh, equity and demand implications of rail transit fare policies. It was a three paper dissertation, and this is one of the three papers looking at the inequitable inefficiencies of different rail transit fare policies. Um, a brief outline here, uh, I'll discuss some of the theoretical and policy foundations of my research, uh, and then get into the literature review briefly of what has and hasn't been studied in this uh, area, and then discuss my case study methods and findings, and then some closing remarks about uh, additional research to be done in the future. So, this is really uh, motivated in the area of urban economics. Uh, we know that people make location decisions based on an interest in maximizing their utility subject to financial and other constraints. Uh, key aspects of that is the balance between land and transportation in urban economics theory. Um, but a lot of uh, transportation policy and research and planning uh, looks pr primarily at, let me make sure, okay, primarily at fighting the, uh, the effects of our urban form patterns. We don't spend a whole lot of time looking at the causes, and part of the meta-narrative of my research agenda right now is looking at how inefficiently priced transportation systems effectuate the urban form patterns that we see. I guess you can imagine when you commute home today, whether it be in car, on a bus, or otherwise, ask yourself how much it is costing to provide that service, to maintain the roads that you use or otherwise, and whether or not you are paying that cost as you're making that trip back home. If the answer is no, then you are being subsidized, and that in some which way effectuates the urban form patterns that are resulting. So I use rail transit to test that out, okay? Um, and these are kind of the research questions at hand. Uh, 
how do rail transit subsidies vary spatially and temporally? And after we look at that, temporally meaning across different time periods, you have peak level service, base level service, and otherwise, who actually consumes transit during those different time periods and therefore is receiving the most subsidy as a result? And does this vary by the fare structure that transit agencies use? You tend to see flat rate fare structures, distance-based fare structures, and sometimes temporally based fare structures, meaning peak period pricing. <clears throat> uh, this is not a new area of research to be sure, but it is outdated and there's much better data available than has been used in the past. Historically, buses are the source of this research question, looking at bus fare policy. Rail is underrepresented in the literature, and you'd have to go back to the 80s and 90s for, to see much literature in this at all. Furthermore, uh, the measurements of equity that are used do not account for what I call the cost-sharing nature of transit. Transit, if we really drill down to it is mass carpooling. Uh, you know, you, me, and many of us going to com from common origins to common destinations will pull together in a bus. That's what transit is at, at a uh, reduced understanding, if you will. Um, how well different riders share in uh, covering the cost of the travel is not really controlled for in past research. Instead, uh, we look at how much riders pay per mile of travel that they consume and treat every mile of travel to have a similar cost. Whereas if many of us pull together, we can share that cost and the cost per rider, therefore, is less. So that has a different effect on the level of subsidy, uh, which is not accounted for in past research. And that's I would say is my greatest contribution in this. So my case selection, as you may have heard, I don't know if I mentioned it already, includes BART. Uh, I served on the BART board, but it also is, uh, it, it serves in this uh, diversity of fare structure possibilities. BART uh, operates on a distance-based fare structure, but it has a step-down pattern in the distance formula. You pay one fare for the first six miles, and then to go between six and 14 miles, you pay for the six miles plus a cost per mile up to 14. Greater than 14, you pay for those 14 miles plus a lower cost per mile beyond. So there is an embedded incentive to travel longer distances. You pay less per mile the further that you go, even though it is distance-based. Um, now, both BART and uh, MARTA have a fixed headway system uh, throughout the day from morning until around 8 or 9 p.m. You have service every 15 minutes. The way that BART scales to meet demand levels is they lengthen their trains. Um, the only service that has supplemental runs is this yellow line service. Uh, usually it's between Concord and Daly City that they offer those additional runs. BART reports that they recover about 72% of their costs through fares, which is I think the highest in the country. Uh, but that um, does not account for a lot of costs that I incorporate, most importantly, semi-fixed capital costs. By the way, my study period is 2018-19 in order to control pre-pandemic period. Um, MARTA, by comparison, uh, has a flat rate fare structure. Uh, I believe it's just $2 regardless of whether you're going from end to end or traveling just one station. Uh, it also operates on a fixed headway. It does bring out, I think, two, maybe three additional trains during the peak of the peak, but as you'll see later, that peaking is very limited on an operational uh, standpoint. They do not resize the length of their trains to accommodate variations in travel demand. <clears throat> and they report a cost recovery of just uh, 37%. So 
I won't go into the nitty gritty of my models in this forum, um, but just to give you a sense of the flow of my methodology. The first things first, in the cost allocation part of this study, which is not the topic of today, um, it, it, I, I, I have to devise time periods by looking at the operational patterns and the number of trains and rail cars that are in service. That gives me a sense of what time period is base versus peak versus otherwise. And then I allocate costs across those time periods. And then there's a spatial component. I look at how much service is operated across different stations and links of the network. I have station and link attributes in order to estimate maintenance cost and other cost of providing service to those links and to those stations. Um, and then I take the average of that across the links and stations and across the time periods to estimate a cost per rider. And that helps me devise ultimately a cost on a trip level basis. Um, I'll show an example in just a couple slides. Um, and then there's the cost recovery estimate. Given what you actually pay, just $2 at MARTA versus what it costs to provide you that trip, that is your cost recovery um, for the given trip. Uh, is there parity across trips? Do all people pay approximately the same share of costs uh, when they pay their fare and consume the trip? Uh, if the answer is no, then there is inequity based on how I'm using the term here. If the answer is yes, then there is equity, even if it is inefficient in as much as the transit agency is not fully recovering the cost through fares, hence inequitable inefficiency. Uh, finally, the last effort in this research is to look at the socioeconomic incidence of the subsidies. After controlling for who travels where and when, are certain populations disproportionately benefiting from subsidies than others are. So let's take a simple example. In this linear transit network, uh, let's pretend that there are uniform costs. Every station costs about $10 to operate per day. Every link between the stations costs about $10 to operate per day. And we're going to say that station A is this bottom left station, um, B, C, and D as you move upwards to the top right station. This transit network uh, charges just $2 regardless of how far you travel. We then can look at the flow of ridership. Disproportionately, people are just traveling between station A and station B. And then you have this one straggler who travels the entire length from station A to station D. What does this mean on a cost per rider basis? It means that the person traveling from D to A, it, it costs uh, upwards of $30.20 to provide that trip, even though they're paying just $2. Meanwhile, all of these people who are sharing in the cost of going from A to B, including those 99 riders using station B, 100 riders using station A and the link between A and B, uh, those riders just between A and B, it's costing about 30 cents per trip to serve that. And they're paying $2 for every trip that they take. So there's this inequity in the system where the person traveling the longest distance, not only in length, but also uh, distance from the core of the center is being especially subsidized. <clears throat> And that is uh, reflected here. Um, you'll see how the cost recovery varies after you account for the cost of the trip relative to the fare that is paid in, in these different scenarios. Now, in the analysis that I do, I also account not just for the average cost recovery for a given uh, origin destination pair, but when you weight that to the number of people who consume the given trip, and while the system recovery is the total cost, um, the total revenue divided by the total cost, so it's making money, that overlooks variability across the network. And that's kind of the story that I'm trying to tell in this research. When you look at the aggregate, you lose track 
of the disaggregate uh, distribution of subsidies. That person going from A to D is being cross-subsidized by those who are going from A to B is the story here. Um, when you weight it, um, you, you'll get that this situation that you see here, uh, where it looks like there's uh, a, a weighted cost recovery of 660% uh, because you're giving more weight to those who are traveling just between A and B. So if the agency only operated between A and B, this, this is meant to represent how much better it could potentially recover its cost when you, when you weight the, the uh, cost recovery patterns. Um, so after looking at those origin destination patterns, I then create station and link profiles. So given people who begin or end their trip at a particular station, what is the average cost recovery of their trips that they consume? So for all of the OD pairs that start at station A, weighted to the number of people who use each of those OD pairs, this represents the cost recovery um, for station A uh, up top. And then for links, I'm looking at trips that traverse through the link. So I'm able to assign trip uh, paths in order to understand how many riders are using every link and the average cost recovery associated with that link. Um, and these are my regressions. Uh, there are some limitations to this that I'll cover later that I'm working still to resolve. But I'm trying to test for whether looking at trip length alone tells the full story, or if we need to look at um, spatial patterns, namely the distance that uh, different links and stations are from the core of the network. Is it the case that as you get further and further and further from station A, uh, the cost per rider increases such that under different fare policies, uh, your cost recovery will go down, not because of trip length, but because of distance from the core station. Uh, core stations at BART, uh, it is West Oakland Station. And in the MARTIS system, it's that middle station that you saw on the map, which is called Five Point Station. So, I'll summarize the findings from the cost allocation study. Again, I'm not, um, I'm not gonna go through how I, how I allocated the costs here uh, in, in entirety, but this shows you the distribution of cars, rail cars, and trains that are in service in the BART system throughout a, a typical weekday. On the left-hand side, you see the number of cars that are in service, it peaks close to uh, 580 or so cars during the peak of the peak. And as they scale down the number of cars on every train, it comes down to about 320 cars that are in service during this midday base period. But as you can see here, the number of trains that are in service does not change substantially. The peak period at BART is response, 41% of BART's rail cars are exclusively purchased and maintained for serving the peak period. So that's in parallel with our criticism of our roads being built out just to serve the peak. So too is rail car capital purchased and maintained just to serve the peak. So that is a peak period cost that I assign to peak period travel. In MARTA, this is the distribution there. Again, MARTA does not uh, resize their trains to serve the peak period. So there's this uh, proportionality between the number of trains in service and the number of cars that are in service. And again, the peak is not significant because the operating goal with both agencies is to maintain a relatively fixed headway schedule throughout the day. Uh, after I uh, allocate costs, this is how different costs uh, are, are allocated to the different uh, systems. In BART, you'll see that rail car is very uh, expensive during the peak period. It's responsible for about 58% of the rail car costs um, are just for serving the peak period. I mentioned 41%. Let me be very clear. 41% of cars are only used during the peak. Uh, 
The other percent are shared between the peak and other periods, and they are proportionalized based on the share of operating hours that are peak hours versus other hours on a given uh, weekday. Um, there's the train minutes, which is a cost uh, output or a cost input for estimating uh, the labor cost of operating trains. So even if you resize trains, for example, you still need a train operator, and that's what the yellow bars are. Uh, and then you see the pattern here for MARTA is, is similar in as much as these, uh, the peak period is the most expensive, but it's not as much more expensive compared to BART relative to the base period. Now, when I divide costs by cost per rider, um, you know, this is the variation that you see. Although the peak period is very expensive on a cost basis shown on the left-hand side and in blue, uh, the cost per rider shown in red and on the right-hand side is, is actually lowest during the peak period. And this is counter to what past research has suggested. And it, it shows that despite the peak period being very capital and labor intensive, the amount of demand and ridership that is using the peak period uh, offsets those costs. <clears throat> and the story is similar in the MARTA system. <clears throat> um, this table is a lot to go over, but let me show some highlights. So these are cost recovery by time period. Cost recovery is done at an aggregate level. It's the uh, total fare box uh, revenue that is received during the different periods and how much of that um, pays for the cost. So fares divided by cost. Um, and you'll see on, uh, where is it? The percent paid T, that uh, third variable there, is the uh, cost recovery of the different time periods. And you'll see that in the BART system, again, the peak period recovers the highest share of its cost. Um, the variability there in the BART system is a bit less than you'll see in the MARTA system. Uh, but the trip length variability is not as great uh, when you look at the different time periods, certainly on weekdays. In the MARTA system, the percent paid, you'll see how the peak period is 34% compared to 18% during the other time periods. Uh, but the, and then the trip length again, it doesn't vary a whole lot. But uh, then there's the question of the resulting cost recovery shown here. So despite on the left, so on, the, on this left bar, this is costs and subsidies that are paid. On the far right, the red bar is the percent that is recovered through, uh, through fares. So the point of this, a, a reviewer of my dissertation suggested that even if the peak period recovers the greatest share of its cost, it could, in theory, still receive the most dollars in subsidies. And so I, I, I tested that. And what you see here is that the peak period on a dollar amount basis receives less subsidy than the base period in the BART network. Other periods receive less dollar amount subsidies, even if they receive a higher share of, of costs that are paid through subsidies. Uh, and then in the MARTA system, again, it's a relatively similar story, although the scale of magnitude difference between the time periods is not as significant as in the BART system. And then there's the spatial aspect of the analysis. Um, so looking at the travel patterns in the BART and MARTA networks, after I account for every trip during the fiscal year and where they begin and end, you see that there's this monocentric pattern of travel in the BART system, where people are traversing to and from downtown San Francisco uh, in great numbers. Hence, these links get bigger and bigger as you traverse to the Trans Bay Tube, and then make that connection between Oakland and San Francisco, and then it gets smaller in scale. In the MARTA system, that magnitude of change is less uh, 
not as uh, visible, particularly on the station levels, as you can see here. Uh, and I think that is reflective of the more monocentric travel pattern in BART. Uh, this graphic shows that uh, when you count up those first uh, four stations in the BART system, uh, uh, two-thirds of all trips at BART begin or end at the four adjacent downtown San Francisco stations. BART has a total of 48 stations that were in service at this time. In the MARTA system, which has 38 stations, uh, you, you barely get to 50% of uh, trips after counting up to the highest ridership four stations. And those four stations are not adjacent. They're scattered throughout the network. So this is important to bear in mind as we look at uh, spatial cost recovery patterns. Uh, this, I think, was the slide where there was notable difference between the weighted and the unweighted means of cost recovery. So the percent that people pay at the mean, when you just look at the OD, and do not scale that to the number of trips that consume the OD, about 44% cost recovery for an average origin destination pair in the BART system. But when you weight it to the number of riders who use a particular origin destination pair, the average across trips is 63%. Whereas in the MARTA system, there isn't that great variability because, again, it is a more polycentric uh, travel pattern in the network there. Uh, so then I created these station and link profiles. And you'll see that there's, there is variability in the percent paid at the station, ranging from an average user of one station paying only 25% of their costs, uh, and the uh, upper station paying almost 100% of its costs through the fares paid by riders at that station. On the link level, uh, the range is from 25% to 65%. Looking at MARTA, the ranges are 13% to 40% at the station level and 13% to 27% at the link level. And uh, Looking at the OD trip cost recovery model results, so there are some issues with this that I'll acknowledge uh, brief momentarily, but when you regress the uh, cost recovery onto trip length, the distance that the origin station is from the core station and the distance that the destination station is from the core station, you'll see that all variables are negative in the BART system. And the distance uh, of the origin and destination stations has a stronger magnitude and statistical significance effect uh, relative to trip length. And I think that that is reflective of BART's monocentric pattern, when, whereas when you look at the MARTA regression results, it suggests that people who travel to and from stations further from the core are paying a higher share of cost, although this magnitude of the trip length is, uh, is larger. It's a two percentage point decrease with every mile additional that you travel in the MARTA system. Now, Part of the reason for this is multicollinearity between these terms. Uh, I'm still thinking of a way to resolve this because if you think of a linear system to be simple, um, basically the trip length equals the, the, uh, the origin station's distance from the core plus or minus the destination station's distance from the core. If station B is the core station and I'm going from A to C, then the distance from A to C equals the distance from A to B plus the distance from B to C. That's multicollinearity in the model. And I have to find a way to address that in order to account for what I'm trying to convey here, which is that distance from the core matters when looking at, uh, at subsidy patterns. Um, I did not do a regression for station and link cost recoveries. Instead, what I'm going to show you is the one-to-one -one relationship, because there is that collinearity, and it is even more pronounced when you have just uh, 
48 and 38 observations versus over 2,000 and I think over 1,400 in the case of MARTA for the trip level data. So you'll see that uh, in, in both systems, there is a negative correlation that trip length and distance that the station is from the core has on cost recovery patterns. Um, at the station level for the BART system especially, there is a strong uh, explanatory uh, uh, factor there, the R squared being 57 and 42 in the case of uh, trip length. In the MARTA system, it's, it revolves around 20% or so um, for trip length and 24 for the uh, distance that each station is from the core. But on the uh, link level, it is not as strong of a relationship. And uh, I'm not sure why there are dots that are outside of these areas. Uh, so sorry for this not showing the dots. Um, but it, particularly in the MARTA system, it is not an efficient um, distribution, which is shown by this R squared being so low, just 3% explanatory power in the case of uh, distance from the core station. So. This is all to say um, that distance does matter, especially in the BART system, but I do need to work a little bit on um, removing the collinearity between trip length and the station uh, distance from the core. Um, as far as socioeconomic impacts are concerned, so when I presented at TRF earlier this year, the basic findings here was that it was a wash. There was not a clear uh, socioeconomic impact on an income basis or a racial basis across origin destination pairs. But upon further review, the real reason for that is that the sample size was insufficient to draw any conclusions about the population. You generally need a sample size of at least 30 uh, people at random in order to draw conclusions about the population. And if my population is every OD pair, there's over 2,000 OD pairs in the BART system. Uh, BART doesn't have that scale of data. What they do have is data at the station level. So what I'm going to have to probably do here is correlate my station level profiles with the socioeconomic makeup of the stations. Uh, that has a limitation in as much as I don't know where different populations are going to and from at that station. So that creates what's called an ecological fallacy in social sciences. You can't say something about the parts that is true about the whole. You can't take what's true about all people who use a station on average and attribute that to all users of the station. But with the data that I have, that more than likely is what I will have to do in order to show some socioeconomic impacts of this. So um, for future research, things that could uh, be broadened here is interacting space and time. I basically did two parallel studies of the temporal variability of costs and cost recoveries and the spatial variability of cost and cost recoveries. But it's very possible that at different times of travel, uh, the locations that people go to and from have a different cost recovery pattern. And I don't look at spatiotemporal uh, variability. That would have required a heavy lifting, particularly for a dissertation. Uh, now that that's done, I'll have more time to look at that potentially. Um, what I call the efficiency equity paradox. So a lot of equity analysis is, does what I just did. We've descriptively concluded that trip length and distance from the core matters at some level. But what happens if you address that? If I adjust the fares in order to achieve equity and have everyone pay a similar share of their cost, I could just rebalance the inequities in the network because demand will respond to that. And uh, past research, as my research, does not test this balance between uh, what, what the demand response would be to achieving that equity uh, and whether or not the system could really function uh, at a network level if we were to implement fares that achieve the equity objectives of the policy. Um, other modes of travel, such as the car, should be studied as well. I use transit as a case study because uh, 
I know where people tap in and tap out. It's easier to implement the analysis. And I'm a big believer that uh, many of our criticisms of the car can be applied to transit and other modes as well. Um, and I wanted to demonstrate that here, that transit also incentivizes sprawl patterns because we subsidize it through the fair policies that we enact. Um, so in conclusion, uh, distant travel is subsidized. Uh, we, the, the findings that I have here, especially for the BART system, is that uh, we, it might be worth having zonal pricing patterns. Whereas using just a distance-based fare policy, especially one that steps down, uh, rewards distance and does not control for the number of riders who are using those outer links, uh, having a zonal fare structure, which transit agencies moved away from some decades ago, would allow you to readjust the pricing depending how far you are from the core of the system. Um, I think uh, the, the difference in the findings between MARTA and BART is really explained by the travel pattern variability. Uh, most trips on BART begin or end at four adjacent downtown San Francisco stations. MARTA's trip patterns are very scattered throughout the system. They do not revolve around the downtown like it does at BART. Um, and I think my biggest contribution, or at least one of them, is that scale of analysis really matters. Past research looks at the aggregate. It does not look at the link or station level. Uh, and it does not control for the cost sharing nature of uh, trip making. Uh, I have accounted for that, um, and I think future research could do that as we move forward. Briefly, some acknowledgments. These are the many financiers of my PhD program and the research that has uh, taken place here. And then uh, personal acknowledgments to my dissertation committee members, Genevieve Giuliano, Marlon Bournette, and uh, Brian Taylor, who provided a lot of mentorship through the development of this. And then uh, Lisa Schweitzer was a mentor. Victoria de Guzman helped provide some copy editing support along the way. And a classmate of mine, Clemens Pilgrim, uh, produced the R template that was used for some of the analysis, namely uh, allocating trip paths. Um, and that completes this part of the presentation. I, Thank you very much. Feel free. <laughs> um, I think I'm now happy to answer questions. Um, we have someone who will go around to uh, take any questions. And I'll, I'll hear from staff if there's anyone uh, in the virtual session. <clears throat> Uh, thanks so much, Zachary. Uh, this is a great talk and, and very interesting. One of the things that I was thinking a lot about when you were talking about sort of these economic efficiency arguments for policy is a recent trend we've seen from transit agencies in making fair policy decisions that have very different objectives, right? So Ithaca or Tompkins County, uh, Tompkins Area Consolidated Transit, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, TCAT, right, now has made a policy that Older adults can travel for free, right? And people under 18 can all travel for free. And I'm curious sort of how you see this sort of um, trend towards policies and fair policies that have sort of social objectives, right? Um, aligning with your work and sort of how transit agencies make sense of these different competing needs. Yeah, and uh, ideally by now, some of my students who are in the audience could give you an education on that. Uh, but I think it really depends on how you measure equity. Um, if I think a lot of those policies are based on what is generally called outcome equity and wanting to allow everyone to have the same amount of travel and access opportunity. Um, from an efficiency standpoint and from a more market equity perspective, it still facilitates and enables outward growth. It doesn't it chases after the effect, the effect of subsidizing travel so much and rich people and middle income people being able to consume much more travel than lower income people is that we subsidize that travel. Rather than chasing after that cause, we chase after the effects of it by providing 
free transit, which comes at a cost more uh, at a bigger scale. Uh, hello, Professor. I have a question, uh, mm -hmm. though it's not based on the U.S., but it's related to cost uh, cost recovery. So um, last year I was working on uh, um, the women-only buses in developing countries, and sometimes uh, government is pushed to introduce those uh, services because of social reasons, but they stop suddenly because they don't make much profit. So one of our uh, actually teammates was saying that our thinking is very twisted when we think like government should make profit out of this public service. And I was like, okay, I didn't think about it from <laughs> like this way. So, I mean, uh, I would like to know like if, if government should actually make uh, this, you know, uh, profit making service or is it like they should uh, also like cost recovery, but what is the bar here? Like if you go for like 60%, that's fine. You should continue the service. Uh, yeah. Well, I think there's two things, the inequitable inefficiency is the uh, point I'm making here. So if it's fully efficient, it will fully recover all of its cost at 100%. Uh, but when there's variability, when different people in different locations are paying 20% and others are paying 80%, there's an inequity in that. Um, as far as what should be done, I don't have a normative answer to that. I just can tell you that by not achieving full cost recovery, you're creating cross subsidies within the network of travelers. And from a market equity standpoint, that is inequitable. Whether or not from a policy standpoint that's important or not, I, I defer to politicians, which I once was, but am no longer. So. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks so much, Zachary. It's really, really interesting. Um, I have two questions. The first is, especially for students, um, I think it's always, uh, and also for me, um, can you tell us a little bit about the journey to this question? You know, what 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 were the hooks into this topic? Um, like my personal journey to it or the yeah. the academic motivation? No, no, the, like your, your personal journey into having this be the question that really animates and drives your research. And I, I just think it's really, those stories are actually really useful for people, especially for students thinking, you know, from a from a um, from the context that they're in now, you know, sure. how do we end up where we're? How do we end up focusing on what we focus on? And then my other question, if you don't mind me asking, is um, uh, what are the debates that circulate around BART and MARTA around equity and the projects of transportation and the building of these lines? Which, I mean, BART is it's it's not very, very old, it's not young, but um, so what are the debates? So you're showing a particular um, set of uh, um, findings around equity and efficiency. How do they correlate or um, are they in, in, in dissonance with the types of debates that, sh that shaped the massive investment in these systems in the first place and how we imagine them going forward or how the institutional debate around BART and MARTA goes forward? Thanks. Sure. Um I think I'll take the last question first um, as far as how this fits into debates about how to plan and operate uh, BART and MARTA and what brought them about. Um, certainly in the case of BART, uh, long ago there was the key system that connected the East Bay to San Francisco that got demolished in the interest of cars and buses. But then there was this traffic, and that's kind of what created the motivation for BART. It was a way to re return the key system and this uh, isolated right of way that allowed you to bypass traffic. Um, and it created regional connectivity throughout the, system, throughout the region. Um, but I think today a lot of the debate is um, about, you, you'll often hear the claim that when you have these peak period vehicles sitting in storage, they're not being used and there is therefore no marginal cost to putting those to use during the base period. Um, and that's a lot of the argument to, for providing better access equity is providing more routine and standardized frequencies throughout the day. I think the counter argument is conveyed here that when you account for demand patterns uh, and the cost recovery potential, uh, 
and you look at how costs are shared, it is not a, a, an entirely true story that there are zero marginal costs for providing uh, equal levels of service during the base period as the peak period, because you're reducing the marginal cost for serving the peak by doing that. Um, BART and MARTA, I think, both have uh, ongoing debates about whether to extend their systems or reinvest into the core. Um, that I think goes a little bit beyond this study per se, but is something I'll be covering in my uh, transit class next semester, is that push and pull before, between core system reinvestment and system expansion. As far as what personally led me to these questions, um, there was once upon a time I was committed to being a transit planner and believed that there was, man, you know, these special tools and tricks to use to get transit to work and function optimally and be usable by a broader audience than just transit dependent people while also serving transit people dependent persons better. But as I took the course that I am teaching this semester about the transportation land use connection, it, uh, it made me question that and begin to wonder if we just travel too much to begin with and so much that transit can't really be effectively and efficiently operated. Um, and we need to look at that root of the problem and whether or not we subsidize travel too much um, for transit to be well ran or efficiently ran anyways. Uh, thank you for your presentation today and because uh, I had experience study in the UC Berkeley before, and uh, my question is that my impression I, or my experience about the BART is more like a commuter rail uh, instead of a transit, transit system. And uh, many of my uh, friends have the very same impression. So I don't know, like if that, that, uh, that may be because I think that commuter rail is more like a co train instead of the parts. So uh, I don't know if the uh, the future, the target passenger will be changed or um, how you respond to that. Like how you gonna, what's the future plan about expansion or the um, design of the fare can like attract more local people to use this transit system instead of only for the uh, commuters, for the long travel, uh, maybe from the San Jose to uh, San Francisco or something. Thank you. Yeah, so if I understood the question, you mentioned that uh, in your observation, BART operates more as a commuter rail system than a local transit system. And uh, what are my thoughts on BART becoming more of a multi-serving uh, system that provides local service as well as commuter service? Is that a good summary of your question? Okay. Um, I, I think for transit to work efficiently, uh, as with m any product and service delivery, sameness matters. The more same that your customer is, the easier it is to uh, proportion your product and dedicate your product to that consumer. Um, in the case of travel patterns, uh, when it comes to a system like BART, uh, BART is a regional transit agency. I think when you mix and match and try to serve multiple types of travel markets, you are inherently not going to be able to optimally serve them all well. Uh, you do have local service providers in the Bay Area like AC Transit and San Francisco Muni and Samtrans that are there to provide your short distance travel. Uh, but things like BART and Caltrain and the Acela Express train in the Northeast Corridor are specifically intended to target longer distance travelers and that market would be compromised if instead of stopping every 50 miles, they stopped every three miles in the case of Acela for an extreme example. So I think uh, it's important to identify markets and minimize how much uh, you're creating competition and serving multiple markets. <laughs> 
Thanks, Zachary, for a really interesting talk. Um, I also have uh, two questions. Uh, one is, uh, I think it's a really interesting conclusion that you arrived at after a very technical analysis. And so I, I think that like a lot of um, people who are interested in issues of equity, a lot of the community organizations, the grassroots mobilizing that advances things that I think this data supports, they would have a really hard time understanding this, or they're really not even thinking about these kinds of underlying structural drivers that contribute to the transit and land use inequities that they actually live. So I'm curious how you see the possibilities of bridging or engaging communities who could be advocates and consumers of this data to um, or to bring them along so that they can see which, like they probably aren't thinking that they need to change the fair structure in this way in order to achieve the things that they want, but how can you engage with them in that way? And my second question is that there's a lot of interesting policies underway in California that all try to um, achieve certain kinds of change in the land use transportation relationship. So um, it just so happens on Thursday in my class, at our intro class, we were talking about the Sustainable Communities Act that requires uh, metropolitan planning organizations to reduce emissions in order to achieve the state's climate mitigation targets. And then at the same time, um, the new legislation around TOD planning, transit-oriented development planning, because the state is investing heavily in high-speed rail, they want to be able to overcome the land use and, and sometimes people would say NIMBY restrictions around stations to change that. So I'm curious, like, do you see um, those two policy um, mandates or levers as places, as fertile places where this kind of research can take root and why haven't they addressed or used these levers in the past? Is there political resistance to using totally rational approaches? Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I think making this I, making this research accessible to um, you know the broader audience and advocacy groups is one thing, and. I believe there is a way to simplify these findings um, to make them digestible more broadly. I'm not as optimistic about bringing them along, to be honest, um, because the approach of equity, the lens of equity that I've conveyed here, I think is in contrast with what many advocacy groups feel is the right lens of equity. Um, in my class, we talk about outcome equity, opportunity equity, and market-based equity. And this is kind of a variation of market-based equity, that uh, equity is achieved when you pay proportional to what you use or consume. And I don't think that that is the popular perspective um, amongst ad advocacy organizations. Um, and I as perhaps interacting that with your second question about um, why, what my thoughts are on these California initiatives and why they haven't been as um, in depth and sh shaking how we consume travel as much. I, I think we've just as a society have uh, come to accept travel um, as something to accommodate. And so the objective politically is not to um, charge you proportional to the amount of travel that you consume and then see a potential reduction more universally in access opportunities and resulting densification of land use that may result from that, but to try to encourage you to consume that travel in a way that we believe is more environmentally sound by giving you electric vehicle credits, subsidies on transit, so on and so forth, which we've been through the roller coaster ride of over millennia and it hasn't really worked. And I, I don't know uh, if political interest to internalize the cost of travel as a mechanism to address those bigger issues of greenhouse gas, pollution, congestion, et cetera, I, I'm not sure if we'll ever see that. I think the ethos of accommodating travel is too heavily ingrained to see that uh, change. 
hello. Uh, thank you for your speaking. So uh, for me, it it really bridges uh, uh, the social equity, which is really abstract, and uh, the uh, data based research. And my question is about the conclusion. So uh, in the conclusion, it gives uh, many very uh, solid strategies about social equity, how to improve the current uh, situations. So my question is that, uh, can we do some uh, extensions for that? Because it's, uh, it's firstly, it's uh, very quantitative. And finally, we go back to things about social equity. So is there any possibility for us to do uh, quantitative uh, strategies. So the thing may turn into the problem may turn into optimization pro, uh, problem. So uh, my real question may be that: so how can uh, social equity be uh, turned into constraints when we do such uh, optimization? When we do that social based, uh, sorry, uh, data based uh, problem. Okay, I know there are questions online, we'll get to you in a moment. So if I understand your question correctly, is it more or less how can we create a unionized analysis between efficiency and equity? Is there a way that we can optimize both at the same time? Is that more or less your question? Uh, how to turn uh, social equity into, uh, into a constraint we can use in uh, optimization? Okay, how to how we can use social equity as a constraint into our analysis of optimization. Yeah. Okay, uh, I, I do think that that is, my interpretation of that is that that is in line with this question of uh, in engineering optimization and such and economics w does not account for equity. Um, and so there is this paradox between equity and efficiency I do not currently have an idea of how to operationalize those to be done at the same time. My first thought, and I need to work with transport economists to build this up, is basically a two-stage process. Um, what I have done in this research is shown the equity implications of what we have today. We could use that, adjust the fares, in order to achieve equity and then run the model again to see how demand would respond to that based on demand elasticities. We might again see inequities that result from that because they just get redistributed after you adjust those fares and demand responds to that. But after you go through two phases of that and there might be an equilibrium eventually, also, there might not be an equilibrium. It might not be possible to efficiently run and price the system while achieving this equity objective. But that's my best thought at the moment, is a two-stage equation process. There are online questions. Were you going to ask those? So we've got a question from Jiaki. Uh, if you can unmute yourself and yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. And I have a very simple question that is related to um, what you mentioned in the last, that you mentioned the travel pattern and urban forum variations. So I'm just curious about um, what is the difference between the urban forums of the Atlanta and Bay Area? Uh, we know that is, uh, they both have different scales. And how do you think that will uh, affect the travel pattern of the these uh, two transit systems. And uh, you also mentioned the core stations, the distance to core stations in your study. So um, have you detected any uh, multiple cores in both of these transit systems? And will it um, be a factor your, to your study? OK. Um, yeah, so I think the, so in the Bay Area, we do have, in theory, three uh, urban centers, downtown San Francisco, downtown Oakland, and then Silicon Valley, which doesn't really have a, a key center per se. Um, that said, when it comes to travel patterns for which transits can effectively compete against the automobile, downtown San Francisco is that destination, and that is where BART has the strongest uh, ridership, is that's where two-thirds of its travelers go to and from. Um, 
Whereas in Atlanta, you have you don't really have as strong as an urban core in downtown Atlanta. It is much more spread out if you look at the density gradient of the area, and you have uh, multiple nodes on the north end, and a lot of people uh, travel. Like I was, uh, it was interesting to see that the I want to say the second highest ridership pair. Maybe it was the first, but it was between the airport and the station just before the airport. And that's obvious why that happens. Everyone drives to the station just before the airport and then takes MARTA in rather than taking MARTA the full length. Um, I think the travel patterns and the pricing patterns in both settings, uh, as far as parking is concerned, the cost of driving is concerned, and so forth, have an effect on, um, on these travel pattern results within the systems. Uh, I think I, there was another part of your question I feel that I might be missing. Did I cover everything? Um, yes. Yes, sure. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, did you um, include these multiple cores into your study, but you explained it a little bit. I think that is covered my question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did yeah. not include multiple cores. It, I just chose one core to test for monocentricity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. that makes sense. Thank you. Sure. I don't think there are any more online questions from what I can see. Um, any other audience questions here? OK, I see one. Actually, um, it sort of tagged on to the previous question. But um, one of the things that I have noted in my study of cities in the USA, China, Europe, is what I would call the gross lack of density in U.S. cities. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering, looking at some of the statistics, the comparisons between Atlanta and San Francisco, if you also looked at the relative densities of those two cities and maybe what the implications are for that. That's a, a great question. and. Uh, which means alternatively that no, I, I did not do that. Um, I think that is something to potentially include in my description of the two cities. Um, I, I definitely think the level of density in San Francisco relative to Atlanta makes a difference. Another thing which kind of precursors that, I would argue, and it's kind of in my list of future research, is how geography and geology affects density and transit mode potential. When we look at San Francisco, New York, and Manhattan, which is an island, uh, Chicago, which has the lake beside it and the, the river on the other side, I think those create uh, nat nat natural barriers to outward growth and densification. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how much that might explain long term the uh, densification patterns and tra transit mode share potentials. So, Thank you. So. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question about taking your research and using it to study um, like automobile traffic uh -huh. and the, the public costs and negative externalities that exist for that. Do you, I know you've mentioned that you see potential for going in that direction. Mm -hmm. Do you also see um, some difficulties that might arise from trying to take a good that seems to be more isolated and, and then going to something that has other negative externalities that are harder to quantify potentially, like um, free parking or uh, just like, higher rates of asthma for people who live next to freeways. Mm -hmm. And then maybe um, considering that, are there other negative externalities of like commuter rail that like just didn't get factored into this, but you wish you maybe could have? Uh, great question. I, I did not include externalities in this analysis and in my potential future work on roads, I, I wouldn't include that uh, at least in the first phase. 
Externalities are certainly something important to consider to fully internalize social costs. Um, I guess what I convey here is that we don't even cover the direct costs of providing the services. Um, and that's what I would do as a parallel in the road case. There are definitely externalities generated in both scenarios. Uh, I, when I'm standing at Seneca Station waiting for the Route 10, which itself is frequently packed, but I see many other buses pass by that have zero or one person on board, that emits more uh, pollution per person than an automobile does. So I, I think there is potential to uh, somehow measure externalities in both scenarios and see how much that is or isn't factored into. But that would just expand and make the general findings even worse, if you will. We don't even pay the direct costs. What if we include externalities on top of that? Um, so I haven't covered that, but I think it would just exacerbate my general findings. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, we have one. Um, one of the interesting things that I think I've seen with BART's fare structure is that it's incredibly expensive to travel to both Oakland Airport and San Francisco Airport, which I presume is not the case in Atlanta where you still have the flat $2 fee. Does that have any impact on travel patterns to those airport stations and how does your conclusion that maybe a zonal fare system is better, how does that relate to the airport pricing, um, number one? And two, is the airport pricing like a good reflection of like the, the subsidies that go into that or the cost that it takes for people to go to the airport? Like, How does those, those prices fit into the larger pricing model that's, that you looked at? Sure, sure. So um, in the case of the Bay Area and the BART system, there is a premium charge for using either the San Francisco Airport or Oakland Airport. In the case of the Oakland Airport, so you have to use the people mover to connect from the Coliseum to the Oakland Airport. And in my analysis, I remove that um, from the analysis. So I'm only accounting for the trip to Coliseum Station and the use of the mainline service. As far as San Francisco Airport is concerned, I do account for that. And the San Francisco Airport Station has a unique cost. BART has to pay San Francisco Airport, I think it's two and a half million dollars per year for lease space at the San Francisco Airport Station. MARTA does not do that at its airport station. So part of the reason why there is a premium for using that airport station is to recover that lease fee. Um, I won't get into the politics behind that decision, but I think we can all imagine why SFO made that decision. <clears throat> So I think uh, we'll wrap it up here. I want to uh, thank Dr. Mele for this great talk and thank you all for this audience. Um, I'm sure Dr. Mele will be around for a little while if you have more burning questions. Um, and I'll just also plug next week we have another transportation themed colloquium. Uh, there's a panel that Wenfei Shu and I are hosting with uh, practitioners from a bunch of transportation technology companies. So thanks again, Dr. Mele. Thank you so much.